It's great to be here and to have the chance to have this conversation with Lita Hong Fincher. And I'm really glad to see all of you, especially the students over here. Um, as long as she has been publishing, I have been teaching her stuff at University of California, Santa Cruz, starting with her first book, Leftover Women, and most recently, the new book that you'll hear more about tonight. So we'll get right down to it. I'd like to know if you could tell us something about how you got to this project, whether you found it or it found you, and how you decided this was a crucial thing to write about. Um, OK. Thank, uh, first of all, thank you so much to the World Affairs Council for inviting me here. And thank you as well, Gail, for being the moderator. Um, well, I, after writing my first book, I actually wrote a little bit about one of the five young women who became known as the Feminist Five. And um, I had met her, uh, Li Meizhi. So when I heard that these five women were jailed in 2015, um, they were jailed uh, just ahead of the of International Women's Day. Um, and these there were a group of feminist activists who were planning to hand out anti-sexual harassment stickers on subways and buses. Um, and so it was really alarming to, to find out, first of all, that these women had been arrested just for planning to celebrate International Women's Day, but also because I had this personal connection with one of the young women who was in detention. And so I was very personally concerned. And then um, after the women ended up being released after 37 days, because there was this huge global outcry, um, and I was uh, very interested in meeting with at least some of them and just finding out how they were. So um, the women were initially kind of confined, to, um, not exactly house arrest, but very, very closely monitored for the first few months after their formal release from detention. Um, but then in November of 2015, I actually met with one of uh, the Feminist Five. And then, then I just decided, uh, oh, you know, maybe I could meet with all of them. And um, at first, I was just curious to find out how they were, what had happened to them in detention. Um, but then I started interviewing more and more of these young feminist activists. And I was, I, I was just so uh, struck by how, uh, how this network of feminists was much broader and deeper than I had ever realized. And so, so the project really pulled me in. And after, after a few months, I thought, oh, you know, this is really interesting. And I should, I should write a, try to write a book about it. OK. I guess one follow-up question is, why were these women arrested? You said because they were going to do a demonstration against sexual harassment. The Chinese government has anti-sexual harassment laws, anti-sexual harassment posters, a whole vocabulary around it. Sexual harassment is not Chinese government policy. So why was this suddenly an arrestable offense? Yeah, well, I mean, that is an excellent question. And that was the question on everybody's minds when these young women were placed in detention. Um, I mean, it was so shocking because the Chinese government um, officially uh, is a big supporter of gender equality. Um, and these young feminist activists had already been involved in... Uh, what they called performance art for quite a few years leading up to 2015. And not only did they not get into serious trouble at all in the past, um, some of their activities were even really positively covered by official Chinese state media like Xinhua News. And I mean, as an example, in 2012, um, a group of feminist activists organized what they called Occupy Men's Toilets in Guangzhou, where they took over a men's public bathroom, and then they invited women to use the vacated men's stalls to just draw attention to the fact that there are never enough women's toilets. Um, and so the, the issue itself was what they considered to be politically innocuous. I mean, who could object? How, you know, it's not something that's co particularly confrontational. It's not as though these activists were criticizing the Communist Party. Um, but, but it wasn't until much later when I was just doing all of these interviews and then watching what happened subsequently after the jailing and the release of the Feminist Five that I realized um, 
first of all, it, uh, the the government, the Chinese government in general, is being um, has been attacking civil society at large. So that so so anybody who demonstrates an ability to organize effectively around any issue is going to be viewed as a potential political threat. So there's that element of it. And these feminist activists are really well organized. And, and they're uh, all across China and in a lot of different cities. They communicate with each other. Um, they're very successful at mobilizing supporters. Um, so th that organizational element of it is considered to be a threat. But beyond that, I also think that this fundamental message of women's emancipation has come to be viewed as a threat to the current male-dominated Communist Party. And I, I make the argument that the Communist Party today really sees the subjugation of women, reducing women to these very subordinate positions of just dutiful wife and mother as being a central pillar of their authoritarian control. And that it's, it's a really important aspect of what the Chinese government is trying um, to sculpt in its, in, uh, in, in its control over the entire population. Um, and so the, the backdrop is, I mean, it's, it's kind of complex, but uh, birth rates have been falling, and the population is aging, and the workforce is shrinking. Um, and all of this is happening just as economic growth in China is slowing. So the government can no longer rely on um, guaranteeing people constantly rising uh, living standards to co-opt the population. Um, and so one of the ways in which uh, the government has decided that it can stay in power longer, uh, I believe, is um, by trying to boost birth rates and trying to push particularly educated young women into marrying early and having babies. Um, and it's in that sense that the message of feminism is just contrary to what the Chinese government is trying to achieve today. Okay, that raises another question. So this is an audience that follows public affairs, so you will probably know that for a long time the Chinese government was trying to limit births and there was a single child family policy. And although it was not enforced only one child per family in the countryside, it did depress the birth rate. So why now this about face? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, this so-called one-child policy has been criticized even internally um, in, in China for quite a, a few years. And yet the policy itself continued for such a long time. It's been in force for over 35 years. Um, so I think the government was considering changing the policy for a long time, but it, it waited until it was far too late, really. I mean, the, the demographic changes that it's trying to combat are already well underway, you know, with falling births and, um, and, and the aging population. And so the, the change is, uh, I think the government was probably considering it for a long time, but, but they didn't enforce this policy change until uh, the beginning of 2016. Let's pull back for a minute to the bigger context. What can you say about how the possibilities for women and the problems for women have changed since the death of Mao, the end of socialism, the start of economic reforms in the late 70s, but especially the rise of China as a world power over the last 15 years or so? Better, worse, both? Is that the wrong question? Well, um, I think for those people who don't really know about China's history, um, the early communist era was very much about celebrating gender equality. And so, um, and Mao Zedong's most famous saying perhaps is that women hold up half the sky. Mm -hmm. So that was the whole legacy of the communist party. Um, and it wasn't until the party started to dismantle the planned economy after Mao's death 
Um, and then particularly when uh, it introduced market reforms, um, and then the reforms accelerated at the end of the 80s into the 90s, and especially in the 2000s. Mm -hmm. um, along with these really rapid uh, market reforms and then the breakneck economic growth of the last couple of decades, um, along with that came a real a huge resurgence of gender inequality in many, many ways. Um, and so, for example, you have, a, you know, even according to official government statistics, a significantly rising gender income gap and falling female labor force participation. Um, and at the same time, as women became more and more educated, which you would think would be a really great thing for China, um, the government has not welcomed that development. It has ended up um, instead seeing these record levels of educated women as a new crisis um, where they're concerned that men are falling behind educationally. Um, and also as women have become more educated, as women are want to do all over the world when they're more educated, they want to delay marriage. They want to delay marriage and they don't want to have as many babies, which would have been great decades ago, according to China's old one child policy. Um, but now with all these demographic pressures and falling birth rates, th this is seen as a big problem by the government. So I think that, I mean, obviously market reforms have benefited the Chinese people. Um, certainly, you know, the, uh, the party says that it has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Um, and this is certainly uh, and a great accomplishment. But on the other hand, if you're just looking at the status, the relative status of women relative to men, um, that status has fallen. So even though women are economically um, better off in absolute terms than they used to be, um, their status in many ways have, has fallen. And particularly under Xi Jinping, there, there's been a real uh, new intensified aggressive propaganda push to target particularly educated young women, very forcefully trying to push them into marrying before they turn 30, marrying and having babies before they turn 30. Um, and there are a lot of new forms of gender discrimination that weren't really apparent in the past and that have come roaring back. Okay, that you should say some more about because I know in your first book, Leftover Women, you talked about real estate and property ownership. Could you explain a little bit about that? Sure, well, um, in my first book, which was really based a lot on my PhD research, um, as uh, I, I was doing my PhD in sociology at Tsinghua University, um, I looked at how the privatization of housing in China had affected uh, gender and the status of women. And so um, it, I, I don't want to talk too much about it because it's a little bit complicated. But um, effectively, I argue that the privatization of housing ended up creating this massive new form of gender inequality and wealth um, because housing used to be just allocated by the government. So it didn't cost anything. It was, it was just a, a benefit provided to everybody. It was basically f free. Um, and then when housing became privatized, um, women I found in my research were really shut out of this enormous, massive accumulation of real estate wealth. Um, and uh, there was also a change in the marriage law that made it, uh, that that it, it, prior to the change in the marriage law in 2011, uh, marital property was considered to be common property. But then there was this new interpretation in 2011 that said that if a couple is, a married couple is getting divorced, um, then whoever ends up, whoever has 
uh, formal ownership of the marital home and has their name on the property deed, that person gets to keep the property. And so, so many women in China don't have their names on the marital property deed. And this was one thing that I kind of researched at length, all of the different factors that that uh, prevented women from having their names on property deeds. Um, and then also the fact that parents wound up saving a lot of money to buy homes for their sons, but not for their daughters. And so the, all these ways in which just the flow of money uh, ended up flowing towards men in the family and away from women. But that's just one area in which gender inequality is really surged. There are also other, a lot of other indicators of gender inequality. And that's the general backdrop for this new uh, new feminist movement that has grown in recent years. Okay, so that's what I wanted to ask you about next is, who are these new feminists and what are the issues that activate them? Well, um, first of all, sexual harassment is a very important issue for these young women. and uh, But it, it, it hasn't just been sexual harassment. They've been, they started out uh, getting very active in 2012, um, picking issues like well, there was the you know the Occupy Men's Toilets action that I described. Also, domestic violence was another big issue for them. Um, there was one uh, action where these three young women wore white wedding gowns that were stained with fake red blood to make a statement about the epidemic of intimate partner violence in China. And the fact that at that time, 2012, there was no nationwide anti-domestic violence law. Um, but they've been very pragmatic. And uh, the activists have taken up issues that they thought um, attracted public attention. And so they often would take up a, 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 an issue that was getting news attention. Um, but in recent years, it is increasingly focused more and more on, on the issue of sexual harassment. And in fact, that was the issue for which the Feminist Five were all arrested in 2015 because they were planning, they didn't even do it. They were just planning to hand out anti-sexual harassment stickers on subways and buses. Um, I mean, that's hardly something that you would consider to be uh, politically problematic, but but it, it, it was. So these problems that have activated them, sexual harassment, sexual assault, domestic violence, in your assessment, are they new problems or are they getting more complete public attention, old problems that people are now paying attention to? They're very much old problems. Um, and this is what I find to be really quite inspiring about the women's rights movement is that um, it's not just that the, there are these really radical feminist activists at, at its core, but it's also that in recent years, there have been more and more ordinary young women, especially women who go to college and have a college education, who um, are no longer content to just suffer in silence, which is what women have done for literally centuries in many cases, uh, with notable uh, exceptions around revolutionary episodes. Um, but, uh, but in recent years, certainly since the founding of the People's Republic um, in 1949, um, domestic violence has been bad, you know, sexual assault has been bad. Um, but there's a, in, but in recent years, in part thanks to the efforts of these feminist activists, um, there's just more of an awareness, more of a sense that, you know, that women don't have to stay silent, that they can find others, that there's strength in numbers, and they're more willing to speak out about their own suffering um, and to de demand equality or de demand rights. Okay, that brings up the question of how they organize. China's a very big place. People are scattered over a very large territory. You talk a lot in the book about internet and social media, and I wonder if you could explain, these are mostly younger women that you're tracking in this book. They're kind of the born digital generation. 
how do they make use of that media and how is it different from say what people their age would be doing here? Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, China is uh, an, an environment that's very hostile to any kind of social movement, um, any kind of organizing. Because there's no internet freedom, there's the great firewall, so people don't have free access to information over the internet. There's very uh, aggressive interference, censorship, and surveillance over the internet. Um, then there's also no press freedom, um, and there's no f essentially no freedom of assembly, um, and effectively no rule of law. So it's very, very difficult to organize a social movement in China. And so uh, for people who don't understand that about China, I think it's, it's really important to emphasize it's very hard to organize in that kind of climate. And yet, these young women have uh, just been very adept, very creative. Um, they adapt really quickly um, in the face of these barriers. And, and they have, in spite of this very heavy draconian internet censorship, they they react really quickly. So, for example, um, this Me Too hashtag movement about sexual harassment really took off against all odds last year in 2018 in China. And um, it's quite remarkable. So, uh, in, in spite of the fact that internet censors were censoring the Me Too hashtag quite aggressively, um, one way that the feminist activists got around that was to, uh, one activist came up with the idea of using emojis for me too, which sounds like me too in Chinese, um, but it was rice and bunny rabbit. And so she came up with the idea of using the emoji for a rice bowl and a bunny rabbit. And that would stand for, you know, me too, and then you could use that to communicate with other people about your story of sexual harassment. And so that was able to get around the internet censorships for a while, but, but then of course the censors caught on. Um, another way in which some people were spreading um, a long account of intimidation at Peking University over um, sexual harassment and a Me Too related uh, incident, was to use blockchain technology to encrypt or to to imprint this essay. And so I, I don't ask me how that technology works exactly, but um, that was the first time that that, that uh, using blockchain it, um, as a way to get around the internet censorships. That, that, that would, they also tried that. Um, or um, it, at the end of International Women's Day last year, so the night of March 8th, censors banned the most influential feminist social media account, Feminist Voices. Um, and I thought, okay, this is a really heavy blow to the women's rights movement. Um, but it, it, in spite of that, it, because they, they cut off the most popular way to just distribute feminist essays and, you know, um, slogans and that, that kind of communication. But activists still used individual accounts to spread messages. And so um, they continue to just adapt constantly to the censors and react very quickly. Um, and so, so this movement overall has just proved to be incredibly resilient. Um, which I find to be quite remarkable. So these feminists are not China's first generation of feminists. All through the 20th century and every revolutionary movement, women have been involved. And in the People's Republic, wh whose official position is for gender equality, there has also been an official feminist movement and then the growth of an NGO kind of feminist movement, especially from the 1990s on. So. How are these women different from earlier generations of feminists, besides that they're so digitally adept, which you could say about activists here versus slightly older generation of activists? What else distinguishes them in their approach or their goals or their analysis 
from, say, women that are now in their 50s and 60s that might have been active organizing for women's issues in the 1990s? Well, I mean, the, the, the biggest difference is that these young activists are acting on their own. They're completely independent of the Communist Party. So any of the women who were organizing um, for women's rights prior to that, well, after the establishment of the People's Republic in 1949, any kind of women's organization had some kind of tie to the official Communist Party. And whether that was through the All China Women's Federation, the state agency that was supposed to promote women's rights, um, or some other, some other official link. Um, they were s in some way or another officially sanctioned. These young women are not. They're, they're uh, just spontaneously organizing. And that is certainly a, a, another reason why they're seen as a threat, because they're not part of the All China Women's Federation in any way. Um, and so, that's very new, but that's certainly not new. In fact, I, I have this uh, little history chapter in the book where I draw some parallels between um, the feminist activists today and feminists at the turn of the century. Um, and I, I think there are parallels and um, with these very visionary feminist revolutionaries around the turn of the century. Um, one of whom was Tio Jin, who was beheaded for plotting to overthrow the Qing Empire. There are quite a few parallels, I think. And that's another reason why I think the Communist Party sees these young women, because of course the party is well aware of all of its revolutionary history and its roots and the importance of feminism in China's revolutions. It's well aware of the... Uh, revolutionary potential of feminist organizing because that's such an integral part of the Communist Party's own history. And that also, I think, really spooks senior party leaders. Although it's a, it's a bit of a puzzle because these women don't come out and say down with the Communist Party. They say down with sexual harassment, down with domestic violence. These are things the party itself says. So why not get out in front of that? Why not make alliances with them? Why come down on them like this? Well, that's an excellent point. And this is why, part of why I believe the women's rights movement is so uh, promising and dynamic. I think that because it doesn't come right out and say, we're overthrowing the Communist Party, they're aligning themselves with the official stance of the Communist Party. Um, and so it's very hard for the government to just say, these are all subversive you know, enemies of us and we need to obliterate them all. Um, it's very hard for the government to completely crush a movement like this when you can't the government can't specifically point to anything that these women are doing and say that's subversive. Um, and so there's this gray area um, and that's where the feminist activists I think have been very skillful in kind of using that gray area. Um, and, but, but the things that they're calling for are just, uh, just women having freedom to make their own decisions about their bodies. Women, you know, having the freedom to decide whether or not they should get married or have children. Um, those are things that really resonate with millions and millions of young women across China. And so th it's, a, it's very powerful, the message that they're spreading and that also really complicates the challenge that these women pose to the government and, and makes it very difficult for the government to kind of figure out how to handle these activists. So on the one hand, they are really cracking down on them and persecuting individual feminist activists quite intensely.
But on the other hand, they have not yet conducted a really brutal crackdown or roundup of hundreds or even thousands of feminist activists and jailed them all, which they could do. Um, I mean, they're fully capable of doing that, but they haven't done that yet. And so there are some instances where the government has come out and said, for example, the Ministry of Education in response to a wave of Me Too actions across dozens of university campuses in 2018, the Ministry of Education said, okay, we're now going to introduce a nationwide mechanism for all universities to deal with sexual harassment. Um, and the government also announced that they were going to introduce a civil code on sexual harassment. So, so you can see that the government is trying to show that it's responsive to the demands of these young women and also young men who join in with the women. Um, but this is partly why the, this women's rights movement poses such a complicated challenge to the government. Let me ask you one more question before I move on to public questions here. You spent a lot of time talking to the Feminist Five and to their various associates. How do they look at the immediate future? What do they think next steps are, given the kind of situation you've just described? Well, first of all, um, the Feminist Five are, I mean, I really delve into their personal stories. But they themselves are, um, they're just a, they're not actual leaders of this movement. It's really kind of a leaderless movement. And that is where its power lies. It's really become just so much broader and sort of amorphous. So you have ordinary young women springing up all over the place, all over China, and, and uh, doing things on their own, of their own accord. So, the Feminist Five themselves are not, you know, they have different um, opinions about where the movement is headed. And I don't think that, you know, they're, they're at all necessarily going to be leaders of this movement in the, in the future. Um, but one thing that these feminist activists in general pretty much agree on is that they have to be very pragmatic and adaptive. They have to constantly adapt to the changing environment, changing policies, changing ways in which the authorities are trying to suppress their activities. Um, and, they're, and they also choose issues like sexual harassment that are kind of universal problems for women that most women can really identify with. And, and, and even young men as well. Okay, I'd like to bring in some of the questions people have submitted that Julia has kindly collected. I'll start with this one. What inspired you to delve into this field? And would you say that there are many more eyes on this movement now versus when you began your research or not enough eyes? Well, there are never enough eyes. So, uh, yeah, I mean, women are always overlooked. Women have... <laughs> I mean, throughout history, all around the world, uh, women are overlooked and erased um, everywhere. And we see that in the United States as well. Um, you certainly see it in China. And, um, and one of the reasons why I felt so strongly about writing this book uh, about the feminist activists was that I really felt strongly that their stories needed to be told and that they they were playing a really important part in China's history. And I wanted there to be a record. I wanted these women to be known. And also, um, along those lines, the women themselves, every single feminist activist I interviewed for the book, with one exception, wanted me to use her name, wanted to be named. And that was so important to them because they are... Uh, you know, in addition to being persecuted, they're just forgotten. There's no record of what they do. And in fact, one of the activists I interviewed said, you know, I, I often feel like, what, what is the point of doing what I'm doing when, I, you know, nobody knows about it? It's just completely invisible. It's not reported in the news. But then that very activist who said that, she admitted to, you know, feeling a, a lot of despair at times 
was still deeply committed to soldiering on. And that's another thing that really struck me was the in incredible, passionate commitment of these young women to this feminist movement. Great. Are there ways US citizens can engage with and support the feminist movement in China? Well, I mean, this is very tricky because the Chinese government has now uh, introduced a new law to control non-governmental organizations, to restrict foreign funding for these organizations and the rhetoric it uses um, it uses, you know, very aggressively throws around this label of hostile foreign forces, uh, namely the United States and the UK um, or the European Union. And so often the feminist activist, not, not just feminist, any activist actually, who gets into trouble will be interrogated and um, a typical line of questioning is, why are you being used? Why are you allowing yourself to be used as a tool of hostile Western forces? And feminism itself has now been identified as a way for hostile foreign forces to interfere in China's uh, management of women's affairs. And so, um, so it's <laughs> very tricky. Um, but I would say, you know, um, even just symbolically, just using social media um, to express solidarity with feminists in China. There are a lot of organizations that have been started outside China, including in the US. Um, there are groups of Chinese feminists uh, springing up outside China and you can you know, get involved in their activities. What advancements in women's rights in China do you have hope to see in the near future? Well, um, I'm very pessimistic when I look at the central government and what it's doing with regard to women. And I see and I kind of fear a greater assault on women's rights in general in the, the near to, I don't know, medium term in China. Um, and so, so I'm very worried about that when I look at the general trend of the Chinese government. But then when I just look at young women on the ground, I'm very heartened and inspired by the fact that so many young women are, are really courageously willing to stand up and speak out and uh, speak out against injustice or... Um, and so I, I, I can't really say exactly where the, um, you know, on what specific issue I think there might be genuine progress. But I, but the, but I, I feel like just, just the fact that there are so many more young women who are willing to engage politically, or by politically I mean just speaking out against some kind of social injustice or... Uh, about their oppression as women or um, or just saying, you know, they, oh, you know, let's say a young woman just saying, you know, I should be able to take the subway without getting sexually harassed. I should be able to go to work without fearing that I'm going to get sexually assaulted by my uh, coworker or my uh, supervisor or, you know, a, a university student saying, you know, I should be able to study without being sexually harassed by my supervisor or my advisor. Um, all of these are reasons for hope, and they're, they're already changing society, actually. Um, and you can see that because, um, because of the uh, various government responses to saying that, okay, we're, we're going to take sexual harassment more seriously. Um, so as long as young women and young men continue to stand up for themselves. I think that, that they're going to be able to preserve for themselves a degree of freedom. And, um, and so that, I'm somewhat hopeful, but then again, you just never know. You never know what the Chinese government's going to do. Yeah. Well, on that note, can you talk more about the push that the Chinese government is making to have, to encourage women to have more than one child. 
Yes. Well, this is this is very worrying, and I do give quite a few examples of the Chinese aggressive propaganda, new propaganda in the last couple of years. For example, um, there's uh, there are some People's Daily articles that are clearly aimed at female college students, telling them that, oh, they should really consider marrying and having babies while they're still in school. And um, it's, it's really on the face of it pretty absurd, but it's also quite frightening. And, and even some of, uh, I was struck by one image that was used in the People's Daily that was very Handmaid's Tale-esque of um, a mother figure who didn't have a face, but she had this college graduation gown and she's cradling this baby. And so, um, I mean, The Handmaid's Tale, I'm talking about Margaret Atwood's dystopian novel about, you know, this fi fictitious world where uh, fertility has plummeted and young fertile women are um, basically kidnapped and forced to have sex and have babies. So. Honestly, I think that if the Chinese government were able to just do whatever it wanted, that's what it would do. But it can't do that. It can't do that because increasingly young women are rejecting that. And so um, China's not totalitarian. There is actually quite a bit of room, even as it continues to become more repressive, particularly under Xi Jinping, um, there still is a, a remarkable amount of space for civil society, which is, which is heartening. It seems like the women's rights movement is mostly young. How are older women involved in the movement, and uh, is there tension between generations, or is there support? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I find that, um, first of all, the, I mean, the older generation of Chinese women themselves, um, it, if they were really old, some of them were actually participating in the communist revolution, if they're still around. Um, or maybe they were around in the early communist era when women were, almost all women were working. And so there's this very strong uh, work ethic um, where it's expected that women should be working when they get married and have babies, that they shouldn't just you know, become housewives. So that's a, a, a very strong aspect of the communist legacy that you still see. Um, I, there are older Chinese women who are uh, even in part in the All China Women's Federation. They can't publicly co come out and say we really support these feminist activists, but privately, um, privately, I, I've been told quite a few of those older women are tacitly supporting the young women's efforts, but they can never come out and say so publicly. Um, but the, the idea of the generational divide is very significant in China. And, and I find that um, in many cases, it's the older generation, the, par the parents, who are the, applying the most pressure on their daughters to marry and to have children. And so a lot of the propaganda that comes from the government about the need for young women to marry and have babies before they turn 30, a lot of that propaganda is aimed at the older generation. And so this is a very real struggle for so many young Chinese women that who, who just personally feel under so much pressure from their own parents. Um, and their own parents are much more susceptible to that kind of government propaganda. And so those generational conflicts can be incredibly intense and painful. Right, I know you mentioned in your book someone who was interrogated by a security officer who hauled a young woman's mother into the dorm room in the middle of the night to interrogate her and, and the mother was saying, please stay out of trouble, stay out of trouble. What can the Me Too movement in the US learn from the movement in China? Well, that's also a really good question. And I would sort of broaden it beyond just Me Too. And um, I think all of us can learn a lot 
from looking at the women's rights movement in China. Um, because you, this is the most powerful, <laughs> the most powerful authoritarian regime in the entire world. It, and so the environment is so incredibly hostile for these young feminist activists. They basically don't have any hope, n not no hope. They have virtually no hope of realizing most of their dreams in their lifetimes. You know, they're dealing with this Communist Party uh, with a, a president who has now abolished presidential term limits. He's going to be president for life. Um, so they don't have the possibility of looking to an election to replace their leaders. And they also don't have press freedom, and so they don't have internet freedom. So the environment they're operating in is just so hostile. And yet they're so courageous, so determined, and they're so idealistic. And I think all of us can really learn from that as we struggle for justice in our own way, or in the United States where you know, we have a lot of rapid um, erosions of our taken for granted democratic institutions. Um, so we have our, our own struggles here and I think that everybody can really learn a lot um, from the example of these young women's rights activists in China. Okay, I'm gonna com combine a few of these questions here. Um, Relative to politics, it seems as though business has been a space in which some women have achieved notable status and power. What happens to women when they become very successful and powerful economically? Do they play an important role in women's issues? Yeah, that's an important point. That point comes up a lot, actually, because, uh, because the news media, <laughs> there's a group that every year in China comes out with its list of wealthiest women in China, and and so there are some rather well-known uh, women uh, millionaires or CEOs. Now, I think it's really important to emphasize that there are a small number of individuals and they don't represent the general status of women in China. Um, and also these women who are... Um, have achieved fabulous wealth through their business, by and large, they don't want to say anything remotely controversial that might hurt their own bottom line. So they, they don't end up saying, oh, you know, I, I support these young women's rights activists. They would not say anything like that. Or, you know, maybe, maybe I'll be surprised in the future and somebody will say it. Uh, but so far, they're, they're business people, and they're, they want to make money, um, and they happen to be women. They also don't speak about their own struggles. Um, and they, uh, I have no doubt that in their rise to wealth and power, these women have had a lot of struggles that are common to all women, but they don't speak about them because they're just protecting their bottom line. So I can't say I'm that enamored of um, female CEOs in China. Okay, what direct danger, you've touched on this a bit, but does the Chinese government perceive in the women's rights movement? Why censor these women when they can only add to the Chinese workforce as the country races to the number one economy in the world? This is such a critical question, because if you're just looking at China's economic growth, it only stands to reason that the government should support working women, should encourage more working women you know, to rise to the top, to participate in uh, building China's economy and maintaining rapid economic growth. And if you look at China's neighbors, um, in like South Korea and Japan that are struggling with the same kinds of demographic problems of falling birth rates, aging population. Um, those governments also have a long tradition of gender inequality and they at least rhetorically, those governments ha are now beginning to recognize 
oh, you know, we should do something to encourage more working women to take, you know, to work, um, and that that would be good for the economy. The fact that there's just no sign of that in China, the government does barely ever talks about the importance of working women to China's economy or to China's future. It's doing the absolute opposite. It says, you know, um, family harmony is really important to China as a nation. And I write quite a lot about this. It's pretty detailed, the idea of family values. So, so this is in, uh, another reason why I believe that the male-dominated Communist Party has made a very deliberate decision that ultimately the most important thing for them is survival. They want to stay in power. And that if, you know, China's economic growth rate falls, well, that's okay. Um, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is ensuring that the Communist Party survives, that it avoids a total collapse as it as happened with the Soviet Union and across Eastern Europe. And the Communist Party has studied that history of the collapse of communism, you know, in these other countries and um, and it has learned its lessons. And, and one of the things that I point to is that um, Xi Jinping in his first major speech as General Secretary of the Communist Party in January of 2013 said that, oh, you know, Gorbachev was not man enough to stand up and resist the erosion of the Soviet Communist Party. And so what Gorbachev did was, you know, he unleashed Glasnost, which was a um, reform, and that just got out of control and led to the collapse of the Communist Party. So Xi Jinping is sort of saying that, well, uh, he um, is a manly man, he's going to be able to stand up and protect China, protect the Communist Party against these perceived threats from the outside. Um, and that fundamentally everything comes down to, you know, what what is it going to take for these uh, old male leaders to stay in power? Um. Okay, slight shift. How is the feminist movement in China being funded and what implications does this have for its sustainability? Well, it's, it's, this is a really difficult question. And so initially, one of the reasons why in 2015 the Feminist Five were jailed is because some of them worked for non-governmental organizations that had received some kind of foreign funding like from the European Union, for example. Um, and then this was used when the women were detained as a reason to suspect them or, or accuse them of doing something quote unquote subversive, that they had accepted some kind of foreign funding. Um, so, but the movement itself has really changed. I mean, first of all, I, I feel like there wasn't really a, a real women's rights movement um, that was a, 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 a real political force prior to the jailing of the Feminist Five in 2015. But now it has evolved to become so broad. It's not, it's not led by any particular individuals. There are lots of different people standing up and doing different things at different times. So it's not being, and so the government constantly says, well, you know, there are Western or foreign hostile forces that are pushing this or that are pushing the Me Too movement in China. Um, but that's just not the case. I mean, this is all, just, uh, it's ordinary young women and even young men who are just choosing to take action of their own accord. So it's, it's not as though there is some, you know, source of major funding from the outside. Right. One person is asking, can you put this in a regional context? GDP per capita is much higher in Japan and Korea, and sexual harassment arguably is much worse. 
is this as much a story of political control as it is about feminism? Well, first of all, I would disagree that sexual harassment is worse in other countries than in China. I mean, it's sexual violence is a huge, pervasive, deep-rooted problem in China. We just don't know about it because of the lack of transparency. Um, and so, you know, you have these international rankings for gender inequality, um, various rankings in China. Actually, China's already fallen on a lot of those international rankings, but there's so many measures of Chinese society that we just don't know anything about. And these other countries like South Korea and Japan, they are much more transparent. Or India, for example, also much more transparent. And so we th think that maybe the problem is worse in those other countries, but it's actually not. Um, so, uh, uh, but there's no question that, you know, sexism, patriarchy is everywhere, it's global. But the, the difference is that in China, it's being very aggressively, deliberately pushed now by the Chinese government from the very top, and that the young people are, are increasingly pushing back against that. Why aren't feminists fighting for equal property rights? Well, um, first of all, the feminist activists themselves are intensely persecuted. And so you always have to keep that in mind. That this is, this is a, a movement that is under, uh, that, is, that is really under, these, these women are under um, a lot of pressure. Uh, you know, some of them have been jailed. Um, a lot of them are routinely kicked out of their apartments. That's another common way for the authorities to put pressure on activists is to, to tell the landlords that they need to kick out the tenant. If, um, and so that a, a lot of the feminist activists have been, you know, kicked out of their homes repeatedly. Um, and so, so property rights, um, actually they have taken up property rights. Um, a few years ago there were some actions about rural women's property rights and how village committees often didn't recognize um, women's right to land. So they have taken up that issue, but there are so many issues and, and uh, one of the defining features of the women's of these feminist activists is that they seize on an issue that they think has a lot of popular appeal. And so right now, especially with the global momentum of the Me Too movement, sexual harassment and sexual violence is something that affects, I would say, certainly in the majority of young women in China. So this is a, an issue that has very, very broad appeal and relevance. Property rights, of course, does as, as well, but it's not as like, it's not something that women have to live with and experience day to day. It's not uh, as visceral an issue. And it may be something that most women are not aware of even, that, that they don't even recognize the importance of owning property. One last question. I think we're coming to the end of this portion of the program. What are the economic implications of women gaining more of a voice? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I'm not sure if I can really answer that, actually. Um, first of all, I wouldn't even use the word gaining a voice because the government is depriving women of their voice very deliberately. And so it's, women are in spite of all of this erasure and silencing from the government, they are finding ways to express themselves against all odds. And so uh, that's really extraordinary. The economic implications of it, I mean, uh, sad to say, you know, with all of this resurgence of gender inequality, uh, particularly economic inequality, um, that's something that 
that a lot of women can't really control. I mean, it, w whether or not you're able to get a job, are you going to be hired? I mean, there's so much more gender discrimination in hiring in recent years. It's all, there's also a lot more gender discrimination in university admissions, where there are a lot of university programs that blatantly discriminate against women in, in, um, when, they're, when young people are taking the university entrance exams. They often require women to score higher than men. Those are really structural, very deep problems that it's very, very difficult for an individual to just overcome. Okay, um, before we open up the floor for discussion with those of you in the room, I wanna say thank you to you for this excellent discussion, Lita. Thank you so much, Dale. Thanks.